Hey, before we are going on um, this week's topics, which is quadrant testing and treatments, a uh, little Vatten thing. I've noticed over the last month or more that the number of questions relating to the video has dropped off considerably. In fact, for the last two weeks, I've not had a single question about the videos. So either um, I'm doing these videos are so good that there are no questions that you need to ask about them. Now, I doubt this very much because um, I'm not that good. And secondly, um, these are not exhaustive, nor are they comprehensive. They should lead to questions and I'm not seeing them. So the second possibility is that you're not reading them critically. Um, if you're reading these like documentaries or movies and you're just going through them without being critical about what's being said and fully understanding what's being said, then I think you may have trouble in the final exams because in the final exams, there is a section that is devoted to these videos. Um, not nit nitpicky stuff, but on some of the concepts, um, and so on, particularly in the foundational sense that may not be covered um, either in whole or in part on the, in the classroom session. So my suggestion is if this is the way you are using these videos, you go back to the beginning and you review each video critically. If you have any questions about it, go to the Q&A first. If the answer is not there, then email me and we'll discuss the issue with you then. But I would strongly suggest that you do this. Now onto quadrant testing and treatments from quadrants. Quadrants are done by almost everybody and almost everybody doesn't do them properly. Um, this picture is a case in point. You're seeing two quadrants being done on the shoulder there. These are adduction shoulder um, quadrants. This one in particular is adduction, elevation and lateral rotation. Um, almost never done, these two inner quadrant, inner flexion quadrants almost never done. Similarly in the hip, the two extension quadrants are almost never done and they have to be. What you're testing, apart from looking for pain reproduction, is you're looking for the ovoid of motion and whether it is normal or abnormal. So unless you do the full ovoid of motion, you know only half about that joint's range of motion. Okay, so onto quadrant, um, onto ovoid of motion. The ovoid of motion is the extreme range of motion for combined movements. I'll do the rest because it's easiest to see and to do, but it's basically circumduction of the wrist. For the neck, it would be circumduction. So it's the extreme range of combined movements that's almost always in a functional um, direction. So two things you're looking for with quadrants, reproduction of pain and a normal ovoid. The diagram on the left is how I see or visualize quadrant testing. Imagine walking into an oval room. I've drawn a circle because it's the easiest one to do, um, but it doesn't matter about the shape. The lights are turned off so the room is pitch black. How can you tell what the shape of the, the um, room is? The only way you can tell is by touching it. So one way of doing this is put your shoulder hard against it and then walk and let the room guide you around its circumference. This is what quadrants do. Um, you go hard up against the wall with one movement. So that room, that movement stays on at full range. And then you combine the other movements in a scouring motion, if you like, around the ovoid. Four quadrants, um, four parts of the room. So if you take this analogy a little bit further, if you come away from the wall, you take your shoulder off the wall, and it's pitch black, there is no way that you can tell me what shape that room is in. Um, so it's important that you keep hard up against the movement barriers in the joint you're examining. Now, if we have a hypomobility there, what you'll see is a lump, a bump in it. Um, so what you can see in that top picture is that bump being encountered by the um, scouring movement around the wall of the joint. And you come up against it, you go over the top of it, down the other side, and then rejoin the ovoid there. But what you do know is there's an abnormality in that ovoid. The problem is you need to know what that ovoid is. That bump may be a hypomobility in some joints, but in the shoulder, in the correct quadrant, that bump is normal. It's just part of the anatomy of the shoulder. And you can expect to see that. It's pathological when that bump isn't there. 
So you need to know going in what the anatomy of the joint is as far as its ovoid of motion. Um, at the same time, somebody may have opened a door that you didn't know about and you'll fall in where that door is and you'll come around the other room and come out again in your room um, by keeping your shoulder against the wall. This then would be hypermobility or possibly instability. Um, and that's what you can see. Now, this is a very isolated hypermobility. But if the whole quadrant wall or half um, the ovoid wall was shifted out a bit, you probably couldn't tell that from doing this test. So like most of our tests, this isn't great for picking up hypermobility. So this is how I visualize uh, quadrant testing. So its uses. Initially, um, this came out of Australia. Um, Maitland, Jeff Maitland, um, either developed it or popularized it. I don't know if it was about before Maitland, but certainly the modern development of uh, quadrants is can be traced back to Jeff Maitland. It's used a lot in Australia, and most of these will do it correctly. In North America, it isn't done terribly well. But it's used as a test of last resort, or it was then, um, and it still is by a lot of people. It's a test where your routine tests were all negative. You know there's a problem with the joint, so you do the quadrant test, and this does what the routine test doesn't do. But what this the quadrant test doesn't do is be as specific as the routine tests are. So you, you basically lose specificity for sensitivity. If that's positive and everything else is um, negative, then all you can do is use the quadrants to treat the pain, to treat the patient rather. Now you can use the quadrant that is abnormal and you can use it for neurophysiological purposes to reduce the pain, or you can use the quadrant to mobilize the hypermobility by rubbing at it basically. Now, if this is such a good test of last resort, it means it will be an excellent screening test and should be the test of first resort if you're going to use it at all. So um, use it as a screening test. If it's as good as we think it is, then if it's negative, you can move away from that joint, at least provisionally, and move on. This is particularly useful when you're looking for etiologies. You have a patient with low back pain, you're going to look through lower quadrants to find out what might be causing the back pain and you are, do not want to do a full biomechanical examination on every joint in both legs, and it has to be in both legs. Um, so this is where it really shines as a screening test looking for etiologies. So there are your three uses. Treatment, using the quadrants that was positive, and also a screening test, um, for our, particularly for our etiological studies. Pros and cons of this test, um, pros. Certainly for pain reproduction, this has very high sensitivity. You'll provoke pain in joints that are asymptomatic. Um, a good example of this is the hip, where you have a subluxation there that is affecting the lumbar spine. One of the tests of this subluxation is the inflection quadrant scour test of the hip. And this will reproduce pain even when the patient denies having any pain there at all. So it's very good for pain reduction. I think it's also good, maybe not as good um, for pain, for ovoid of motion disturbances as it is for pain reproduction, but I'm willing to bet it's still pretty, pretty damn good. So, um, it's good for that. It's also extremely fast. Uh, the hip can be a little bit longer because you have to turn the patient over to get the extension quadrants. But apart from that, this is a very fast screening test. Cons, low specificity, which actually I don't think is a con because we're using it as a sensitivity test with a high sensitivity, so we really don't care about specificity. The exception to this may be the elbow where it may be specific for different parts of the elbow complex screening test. Um, it's very dependent on the ruthlessness of the PT. We go back to the first diagram I showed you about walking around a room leaning against a wall. That lean against a wall is uncomfortable. Um, on a patient. So you've got to be ruthless enough to discount the discomfort, keep up against the wall and do it and not be too concerned about the patient's comfort because these are not comfortable tests when they're done properly. If you're not going to do this, you're away from the wall, stop doing the test because it's a waste of time and you just look silly. Um, for a treatment, which we'll talk about um, later, it's very, very dependent the success of treatment is very, very dependent on the skill of the PT. 
You have to be ruthless when you're doing the test. You have to be very gentle when you're doing the treatment. Otherwise, you can flare these patients up no end. Okay, so treatment. I'm going to use some terms that are silly, um, but they are descriptive. If we have a hypomobility, we can do one or two things using quadrants. We can wipe it away. So you'll bring the the, the test up against the wall of the hypomobility and rub at it very gently. And you've just got to nudge and nudge and nudge at it. And over time, you will basically wipe out the hypomobility. Um, and this is one of the times where if you overdo it, the patient will wake up screaming the next morning. So be careful about it, but this is the image I want you to have. You're wiping it away gently, a little bit at a time. The other way we can do it is to tap it away, tap it down. This is particularly uh, um, appropriate when you're doing the patella. You find a, you grind in the patella looking for a quadrant there, you find it, and you can actually now tap over that um, hypomobility crepitating area or painful area, and you can tap it down and increase the force of the taps until basically it stops being sensitive. I think these are the two main ways you can use quadrant, but you do have to really be very careful with it. So generally speaking, you see quadrants done on the elbow, shoulder, hip and knee, but any joint with an ovoid of, any joint with an ovoid of motion can be quadrant. Um, and this includes every other joint in the body, basically every other mobile joint in the body that has, a, has a, an ovoid of motion. The one you, and this spinal joints as well, the one you may not be able to do without a lot of complexity is the sacroiliac joint. Um, you have to go through the femur to do this. So as you're, you're moving the innominate around via the femur, you're also moving the hip around via the femur. So if you have a positive, you now have to figure out whether this is coming from the hip or the SI joint. And if it's an ovoid of motion positive rather than a pain positive, then um, you're now down to testing the hip when you're stabilizing the um, innominate finding out if there's a positive in there. If there is, you have a positive for the hip. Doesn't mean to say you can't have a positive for the SI joint e as well, but you can say the hip is confounding the results in the SI joint. If the hip is negative, then it might be reasonable to suppose that the SI joint also has this dysfunction. But you can do these on any joints. You can do it to the finger. You can grind the finger. If you want to think of it, it's grinding for testing, grind the finger around it. It's circumference, basically. So hopefully this is going to answer the questions you may have about quadrants, um, make you do them better than you have been doing and interpret them um, a little bit more um, subtly than you may have been doing. Now, as I go along with this, and I was at Travel Lab, I've got a video of doing quadrants in the shoulder. I was having a lot of trouble trying to embed it on a Zoom recording. So in the end, I gave it up. You'll get it as a separate um, posting from Dave. 